Okay, I think we're uh, ready to start. Thank you so much uh, for joining us at our closing event um, of our spring 2022 program. It's been really a dynamic program and me and my team members are really happy to share with you all of the accomplishments uh, we've we've made during the spring. So welcome, welcome uh, in person, welcome on Teams. Um, we will have uh, two guest speakers from the FAO uh, Liaison uh, Office in Brussels, and then uh, one of our BRIAS fellows, uh, Dr. Heo Norbert Mons. Uh, at the FAO Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific uh, later this afternoon. But first we will commence um, with our first uh, talk by our BRIAS director. And without further ado, Frank de Koenig. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, distinguished guests, fellows, colleagues, friends, Welcome at this closing event of the spring program. Our uh, co-director of BRIA, Serge Joma, is currently on a mission in Lubumbashi and therefore apologizes for not being here, uh, but he sends his best greetings to all of you. I will give a very short overview about BRIAS and what has been done, but I will leave, of course, the details to the responsible uh, academic co-directors. Now, BRIAS, the aim is really to be an incubator of ideas. It strives to be an incubator and preferably disruptive ideas, okay? Which really can change the course of science in the field. The theme will always be sustainable development. For example, this year's a uh, theme on food and the relation with climate and sustainability, history, etc., is typical for uh, an Institute of Advanced Studies theme. We invite high level scientists from different disciplines, very important, different disciplines, in order to be able to discuss, collaborate, but Br building bridges over the disciplines. It's to be done in absolute academic freedom, of course. We want to do this in an atmosphere free of daily hassles. Why? If you want to think out of the box, you cannot at the same time think about all the problems you have at home, all the problems you have at work, etc., etc. You have to be to clear your mind in order to be able to dream, to be creative, etc. And we hope that this will lead to advances on unforeseen paths. This is the disruptive effect. So team and sub teams. You know what the theme was this academic year, the past, present and future of food, climate and sustainability. And there were sub teams, and you will hear more about those, the relation between climate change since thousands of years, the problem of waste and food, and all the food which is wasted, but also upcycling of waste in order to give it a second life, the problems associated, and solutions associated with the Green Deal and those policy aspects, and then um, because we think it is very important to address problems which are of important societal importance to countries which really face problems with respect to sustainability, which are more in the poorer countries, of course, than in the richer countries. And for example, agriculture and food consumption in Northeast Africa in history until now is one of those problems. Now, fellows, we had the chance to have 28 renowned scientists from 16 countries which participated for periods between one and three months in presence, but for the whole period via Teams. 
we have to be frank, it was a difficult time because of the COVID situation, okay? But even then, the impression I have is that the fellows had ample time to discuss together, to interact together, and to attend the um, seminars, fora, workshops, etc. Location, which is important to have a nice environment. Well, um, from 2024 on, we will have very nice rooms and working spaces uh, where the Brace will uh, fellows will live and work. They are currently renov renov ren um, renovating. renovating. <laughs> Sorry, renovating the buildings. Um, until now, they stayed at the Apart Hotel, which was not optimal, but I think it was a nice place, uh, a nice alternative. Interdisciplinarity. I told you it's very important for us that different dif uh, disciplines uh, approach the same problem from various viewpoints. We had archaeobotany, genetics, biotechnology, you name it, law, economics. And one of the difficulties there is that you have to understand each other. Because sometimes the vocabulary is the same, but the meaning of the words is different. But again, my impression is that it worked out well. But I'll tell more about feedback later. We had about 50 events. In my opinion, it was a little too much, probably, <laughs> okay? But it shows the enthusiasm, not only of the scientific co-directors, but also of the fellows, which is, of course, a very uh, positive point. Then uh, we shouldn't forget, this is the closing sessions, but in fact, there will be a couple more activities uh, still to come this year, mainly because some of the fellows just couldn't come, were not allowed to come to Belgium because of the COVID restrictions. Persons from uh, Australia, Japan, Thailand, Singapore, etc., were not allowed to travel to Belgium. So they will be involved, but of course they could participate via uh, Teams. So I would say to all of you, please continue to check our website, continue to check uh, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook, etc. Um, was there any output? Was, were we really an incubator of new ideas? Well, from what I heard, but I will guess we will hear more about this, uh, there are several projects for common uh, for joint articles, for maybe a research uh, program, etc. And this is exactly what we wanted. We have to be very frank, success is never guaranteed when you organize something which is not research with a clear application in front of you, but when we propose some vague research around a vague subject, with different disciplines, etc., it can the result can be wonderful, but there can also be no result at all. And this will, in fact, only show probably uh, a few years from now what the final result will be of every one of our programs. So we will, of course, follow up. We will contact all the fellows and ask them for what were the strong points, but especially what were the weak points where we have to work to improve. Okay, this is part of our responsibility. Other aspect which is very important is if you live somewhere for a couple of months, uh, it's not only science, it's also social life and cultural life, which is important. It's, an, it's a unique experience, of course, a unique equation to experience the social and cultural environment in which uh, you live for a few weeks or, or months. And we, of course, had this major health problem, which made everything uh, more difficult. So I was afraid that that aspect, and it may be that for 
uh, a number of fellows, that aspect was, I would say, underdeveloped. Uh, but on the other hand, I received a message by one of our fellows. And she wrote, we visited many interesting museums, such as the Africa Museum, the Brussels City Museum, the Bellevue Museum, Museum of St. Jans Molenbeek, Magritte, Bozart. I, I didn't give the full list because it's too long. And then we had long walks around the city, from the Marol to Saint-Gilles to uh, Eco, Saint quite uh, a walk. Uh, Anderlecht, Molenbeek, Bolwe, Skarbeek, Matongwijk, etc. Okay, and she said all of this allowed us to understand a bit of the different among, differences among areas, people and lifestyles. Brussels is a real mosaic. So this is what we want to achieve and clearly for some it was a success and I'm very grateful to Antonella for having sent me this message. Okay. Uh, I told you that Serge, uh, unfortunately, cannot attend. Um, it's time to start. And I wish you all a very successful meeting. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I will be setting up the next talk. Just, just a moment. Our next two speakers are from our uh, ULB team from the Crop Production and Biostimulation Laboratory. And our first speaker is uh, Christian Hermans, uh, followed by uh, uh, David Canella. All right, we're almost uh, set up. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, so David and I we were uh, responsible for the food waste, waste for food, depends how we, the order we say, <laughs> but the, the topic is, is there. Um, this is uh, one of the, the sub team of the, the Brias. Um, ah, so I call this differently food for plants, waste for food <laughs> compared to me. Um, we will host uh, in the second part of the program today a uh, representative from the FAO uh, and that's the, the analysis in 2021 is that the world is at a critical uh, juncture. So they identified some threats for global food production around the world. So first is the fast growing population, the economic slowdown after the, the pandemic, um, the environmental degradation, the climate change, and uh, the impact it has on the, the crop yields, which are decreasing. Um, so therefore, new ways of thinking um, uh, have to be uh, considered and to find some solutions for uh, global food security and sustainability. And therefore, the, in our uh, sub-team, so the Brias Fellow, they brought together their expertise at different level, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary level, as uh, uh, Frank just told you, and they share their, their insight. So we will go through uh, quickly. Uh, the purpose is not to make in 10 minutes uh, the program of three months. Uh, in advance, I apologize if the work of uh, other people are not cited, but uh, we will go, just go quickly through the, the activities we had. So these are the fellows who were hosting in the crop production and biostimulation uh, laboratory. Uh, unfortunately, two uh, of them, so uh, Stefan Gert and Natsu Koko Bayachi, they could not come uh, because of the, uh, the, the restrictions, um, but they were uh, uh, still following online and they gave some talks. So during the, the opening, so uh, we learned that the plants were driving all terrestrial food webs. And uh, uh, Seth Murray, I think he's online, I've seen him, so gave the introduction uh, lecture uh, and he spoke about uh, crop breeding. So that was an interesting uh, slide, he showed concept. So where uh, did the crops uh, come from? And uh, so actually, uh, they come from scrublands, from wasteland. So when the, the men started to uh, trash uh, 
uh, what they were not uh, using or eating. So seeds started to uh, to develop, and that's how the the early breeding started to uh, uh, to work. Uh, something you highlight also is the pace uh, of change uh, is quite low uh, in breedings. So I made the the picture a little bit. Uh, how do you say this? Blue. 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 Blurred. If <laughs> I'm not doing advertisement, that's one of the slides I was showing you. During seven years, you see what type of a telephone with a, a keyboard we we had, and now to to have a, a digital telephone. So it took seven years to get. <laughs> At this, but this is the time you would spend to create a new uh, variety uh, of maize because he is, he is a maize breeder. So plants are uh, driving terrestrial uh, food webs and they are phototrophic organisms. So it means that they use light as a source of energy to fix CO2 into uh, sugar. This is the photosynthesis uh, uh, process, really important. Uh, for food production. So we had a, a workshop uh, on this. And in that task, the plant, they also need a certain amount of uh, uh, mineral nutrients. There are 17 being said essential because they fulfill a biological function and the plant cannot uh, grow if you remove one of these. There are also some non-essential elements which are not essential for plant growth like uh, cesium and selenium we spoke during the, the brias. So let's go uh, quickly through the uh, photosynthesis. So Mark, he had the back. <laughs> he uh, presented uh, uh, his, uh, his research on, uh, on photosynthesis. And uh, he started from, uh, so this consideration is that photosynthesis uh, was not really improved over the last uh, century. And the, the question he asked is, uh, which are the bottlenecks? Uh, uh, how to measure photosynthesis? Uh, is there any uh, genetic <coughs> variation in photosynthesis that we can uh, improve genetically? And to move from model organism like Arabidopsis. Uh, so you heard about that plant during the, uh, the, the season here. Uh, so this is the, the model species and how to move from uh, the model species to, to crop. So the uh, platform is uh, is using is on chlorophyll uh, fluorescence. Uh, what is uh, chlorophyll fluorescence? This is light emitted by uh, the, the plant in the red wavelength, but we will not see it through the, the eyes. You need a special equipment to, uh, to observe it. So the plants are absorbing uh, light, and this is the photosystem uh, antenna, and only one fraction is used to create charge separation. <coughs> QA, QA minus here, and the other um, uh, part of the, the flux is the dissipation through fluorescence. So you see that fluorescence emission is competing with the photosynthesis. And then if you can, if you have a system to probe the, the fluorescence, you will get indirect information on photosynthesis. So this is a, a chlorophyll uh, suspension <laughs> here. So you see if you excite it here with a UV or blue light, it will refluoresce in the red. <coughs> we can see it with the eye because it is quite concentrated. But here on the table, there are some plants at the moment, they are emitting fluorescence, but we will not see with the eyes. And that's the system uh, Mark has in, in his lab. Uh, this is the, the phenovator. There is version one and, and two, so he can grow those model, model species and he has a camera to uh, measure the, the chlorophyll fluorescence. These are some uh, some pictures uh, of the, the robots and a uh, major finding is that there is a place for a genetic improvement of photosynthesis. I will not go through the, the, the details um, and move to the, the next topic. So uh, Christopher Vincent from uh, the Citrus Research Center in Florida, he showed us some uh, management some approaches to improve the, the micro uh, environment of photosynthesis and he has um, uh, a new uh, way of uh, pest management so against here it's a, a silic uh, it's an insect so uh, attacking the, uh, the the citrus and causing uh, a citrus loss so he's spraying the plants with uh, a clay a red color 
uh, zoom on, on the plan. And um, so the, uh, the pest is tricked by this and uh, uh, it doesn't attack the, the plants anymore because it doesn't have the same color. And at the same time, just doing this is improving photosynthesis and the use of, uh, of water. So now talking about mineral uh, nutrition, I just told you that there are some essential elements for uh, the, the plant growth. And you will tell me, yes, this is nice to study this, but what's the point to, to study these elements? So understanding the plant mineral nutrition, so we can have some impact on human health. On one hand, we can increase the nutritional value uh, of the crops to overcome mineral deficiencies in the human body. Uh, at the opposite, instead of accumulating the elements, we can try to exclude them if they are pollutant, toxic uh, elements. And the second aspect is at the environmental uh, level. So we are trying to develop sustainable agriculture to use less resources and to produce more biomass of the same amount of resources. We had an interesting uh, presentation from uh, Christoph Snook from uh, VUB. So the title was quite catchy, you are what you eat. And uh, he uh, presented us uh, his research on stable isotope in the environment. What was interesting, and this is a figure I picked from his presentation, was to see uh, the trophic level. And if you go here in the, the trophic level, uh, the, the organisms are accumulating more heavy uh, isotopes. So therefore, vegetarian uh, has less IV isotope of carbon or nitrogen than an, an omnivorous um, human. And this is at the top of the trophic level. So the, uh, the animals consuming meat, they have the greatest uh, uh, heavy isotopes. An interesting observation also uh, was this one. So people in Brazil eating uh, uh, maize versus people oops, here in Belgium eating wheat. So you can see from their diet, and so if they eat wheat, they will consume more uh, heavy isotopes. So you can discriminate according them to their diet. Another presentation by uh, Natsuko Kobayashi at Tokyo uh, University was on uh, radio stasium. So after the uh, nuclear uh, plant accident, from uh, Fukushima, the Tokyo University was uh, uh, largely involved in the uh, monitoring of the, the area and so she presented us uh, the latest uh, results. So we learned that uh, uh, cesium, radio cesium, is not really that mobile in, uh, in soil, uh, but once it is in the plant, it can uh, move uh, between the, the different uh, organs. So she showed us some uh, imaging techniques to observe life, the different isotopes. So finally, uh, to close with the, the mineral nutrition, uh, Michaela Scavon um, uh, gave several talks on the, the selenium uh, biofortification. So selenium is a non-essential element for plants, but it is an essential element for the animals. And there are some uh, part of the world where people are deficient with uh, selenium, like in Belgium, or at the opposite, uh, people are uh, intoxicated with selenium. So this is called selenose, for example, in, in China or Central uh, USA, there are some spots. So if you're intoxicated with selenium, so explain that you have your nails cracking and blood, you're losing all the, the hairs, and the same with, uh, with animals. Um, then the most seen uh, picture of the whole program, maybe it appeared 10 times by the, the postdocs in, in our lab. So they explain you about the nitrogen use efficiency. So how we can improve the capture of nitrogen in the soil by just redesigning the, the root morphology. And so when you give a lot of nitrate to the plants that are lazy like us, they don't elaborate lateral roots and then it's favoring the leaching in the soil. And the ideal site we are seeking is a plan which continues to uh, elaborate, uh, explore a large volume of uh, soils. So talking about roots during the, the program, uh, we published two uh, papers in uh, Journal of Experimental Botany and uh, Seth Murray contributed uh, to uh, the study and Christopher uh, Vincent 
uh, too. We visited also the uh, Ancient Art and Modern Art uh, Museum. That was uh, quite interesting to do a tour on food uh, in art. And with this, I give the floor to my colleague David for the second part of the food waste, waste for food. He's doing the opposite. Um. <laughs> you are doing the opposite. Thanks for the, the floor, Christian. Sorry for uh, escaping. Uh, yes, you can get the applause, please. The floor. <laughs> you were applauding. Um, just received the call that Mr. Al Kafaji is just arrived in the campus. So Mark, one of the fellows, just went to escort him here. So he's, he's, he's about to come. Yes, so uh, at the beginning of the Brias, we, of course, decided to, uh, let's say, investigate what the past, present, and also future aspect of uh, agricultural systems and climate and change and, and food production. And so one of the future aspects is absolutely the emerging one, that is, uh, how do we tackle the problem of the waste and the food waste? And then if we can do something else with this food waste, of course, we all heard about upcycling and so on, but if we can also, thanks to the biotechnology development, if we can also squeeze out a few more molecules that we can use in a way that also boosts the food production itself, so the agriculture, and we'll get to that. So it was also interesting as a, a bridging point together with the uh, the other side of the bridge, we call the other side, but this actually now is one side. So the social scientists and the historians and archaeobotanists to understand how in the past all the same, let's say, uh, problematics appeared and how the past uh, societies had tackled the same problems and if we can learn from the past and then to today they propose similar strategies. And so it was very interesting that actually something like that already happened in the past and then it's very nice to know how the past populations had dealt with the uh, let's say absence of food or increasing waste uh, when it came to regional uh, scale. Of course, today we are talking about global scale. Before, probably it was mostly like a regional scale, but it's very interesting to lay out these sort of bridges. So we had two workshops, uh, very, very nice. One in biostimulation for sustainable agriculture, and then of course also in uh, upcycling food or food upcycling. And we had uh, many participants from different kind of university, top level scientists. But one thing that we really like to uh, highlight that also local uh, companies also were interested to attend BRIAS and to present the actual technologies that they are deploying for helping the uh, sustainable agriculture. <laughs> and so it is important for the young year, the students, to know that what you are studying today at the top level of the university education it has already a today application on the uh, agricultural uh, landscape. Then we got three fora. And so this is, it was like mostly on uh, the mitigation of food waste and how we could tackle uh, this problem and also future production of food. And so we also learned that we can now probably do baking in space. And so that was very nice. But of course, every time we talk about that we need biotechnological tools for doing this work. We need to investigate new microorganisms, new systems, and then the fungi are there to help us. And then we learn that many of these uh, fungi, these small microorganisms are deploying these tools for us. Then, of course, we got uh, three dedicated, let's say, uh, Brias fellows, Gabi Berto, uh, Fernando Secado and Marco Zaratini, but also as well, Antonella Pascolore that uh, in somehow touched also the same let's say, uh, thematics by uh, presenting the, the future of pizza production and also the past, of course. Very quick, like Christian says, I don't want to repeat what has been done in three months uh, in, in just five minutes, but please be aware that this is our model, the plant. This is what we want to make it, this one healthier to produce more food. And then the idea is that until so, so far, to make this plant healthier, they were just using pests and pesticides, sorry, to, to fight against pests. And then without really taking care a lot about the disruptive power of these molecules when it came to the soil microbiota and all the other aspects, and then even later to the human 
health for the consumption of this food that still contains some of these pesticides. And so this one heard long time ago to talk about the one health problem. So if the plant is healthy, the soil is healthy, probably also the human being that will produce this, sorry, they will consume this product will be healthy as well. In within this huge thematic of one health, these new technology are rising. And then here we hosted actually two of these Belgian uh, company that are producing either plant activator, so what we call plant vaccine, that's so to boost the immunity of plant, or on the other side, to design antibodies that only targeted and only go fight against the pests. So without, uh, let's say, impacting then the uh, future uh, food quality and still producing, helping plants in producing a lot of uh, good food without having problems like uh, we know about the glyphosate and so on. So this is now nice to show that actually it exists this is a reality. Along, uh, around this topic, we also managed to invite uh, <coughs> academics from York University and so on. So then uh, we learned, thanks to Gabi Berto, that uh, we could now transform the biomass, so lignocellulosic biomass, into a sort of uh, small molecules. These molecules, which are oligosaccharides derived or uh, cellulose nanofibers, so coming from waste, can now be included in within our future food. So they already show the positive effect on the rheology of uh, yogurt, gelatos, and then Anthony, of course, got the idea, why don't we put inside the pasta? So the new pasta might be made of these cellulose nanofibers. It is nice to show that already there was like a sort of bridge, thanks to Brias, be made by Antonella and then Gabi Berto from so Brazil to Italy, passing by Brussels. So this is a very nice and we are actually looking for, uh, forward for this possible uh, collaboration. The next, and I think it may be my last slide, is also that we learn that new future food can arise once again from the, uh, let's say, the use of waste, so the, the let's say, transformation of waste, instead of using the classic sugar cane bagasse for producing sugar, in future we might use instead the sugar or the, the, the lignocellulosic waste that comes from this uh, production and use this one as a power for growing the fungi. This fungi might produce sweeteners, protein, which are not at all sugar, but still deliver us the same functionality, the sweetening, and so without giving us all the problem of uh, diabetes and so on. So once again, not only uh, lowering down the, uh, the impact of producing uh, food, so the CO2 impact and so on, but also improving the dietary uh, nutritional values. The last slide? No, I think, I believe. And then this is one of the talk we had during the, one of the forum about the food waste dimension today. So this is one of the astonishing message that take of message we got uh, that day is that actually we are getting better and better in producing food waste rather than the other way around. So this is one of the uh, take home message that by uh, increasing the amount of food production, we actually did not uh, change so much the food, the, 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 the land use. So the land use from the 60 to today is still the same but we are improving a lot our, let's say, uh, productive system. So we are producing more food, but at the same time, we are also producing more waste. Up to a third of this waste produced, so of this uh, food produced is actually waste. So this is one of the questions we left and we are still <laughs> wondering how much CO2 is leaked from all this uh, waste or food waste that is produced and not consumed. And so by lowering and by tackling this uh, sort of fundamental question, so now we are moving ahead with the uh, future, uh, let's say, uh, collaborations to also understand how much uh, beneficial can be the food upcycling when it comes to the uh, mitigating the CO2 <coughs> impact. So with this, I, I'm, from, I'm finished from the ULB side. And so these are now some few pictures that we took some to our highlight the social aspect of uh, being as a fellow in uh, Brussels. So what does it mean being here? And yeah, so I leave the floor to the other colleagues.
you very much, Christian and David, and congratulations on, on this really successful program and what you're able to accomplish. This is really, you know, at the core of Bria, so thank you so much for presenting these results. I'm just going to set up the next presentation. Um, just a moment. Okay, so our next, um, our next speaker is Dr. Fritz Heinrich, who is um, one, of, one of our team members uh, from the Freie Universität Brussel site, and he will be talking about uh, his sub-theme, Agriculture and Food Consumption in Northeast Africa, 6000 BC to present, 8000 years of resilience, adaptation and innovation in the face of drought stress and climate change. Fritz? Thank you very much, Jeanette. Just... Can you hear me okay, also online? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's always good to get some feedback. That's, uh... <laughs> In the study of society, exclusive concentration on a speciality had a peculiarly baneful effect. It will not merely prevent us from being attractive company or good citizens, but may impair our competence in our proper field, or at least for some of the most important tasks that we have to perform. Nobody can be a great economist who is only an economist, and I am even tempted to add that the economist who is only an economist is likely to become a nuisance, if not a positive danger. This is a quote from Friedrich Hayek, the 1974 laureate of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics, when making a case for a more interdisciplinary approach in his field to better facilitate addressing complex, societally relevant questions and challenges. Of course, this quote does not only apply to economics, but to all scientific disciplines. That is why an initiative such as the BRIAS program that brings together around a single theme a multitude of different researchers, approaches and perspectives is so valuable for scientific progress and discovery. The team selected for the first installment of BRIAS was the past, present and future of food, climate change and sustainability, a topic so multifaceted that it was singularly suitable to capture the spirit of the BRIAS program and what it sought to accomplish. To facilitate concrete discussions and debate, BRIAS, however, required subteams, not as a bridle to stifle or to restrict, but more as a lens to provide focus while leaving room for diversity beyond that immediate scope. The team that I had the pleasure to coordinate this year was entitled Agriculture and Food Consumption in Northeast Africa, 6000 BC to Present, 8000 Years of Resilience, Adaptation and Innovation in the Face of Drought, Stress and Climate Change. In my talk today, I will not be focusing on the intrinsic importance of this theme in light of recent developments. And as we have discussed in workshops over the past few months and even still yesterday, its importance is quite self-evident. Instead, today, I would like to focus on the tremendous amount of outputs that our esteemed fellows and other participants who operated within the team have generated already and will be generating in the near future for the productivity, resourcefulness and cross-pollination, to use a plant metaphor, of the interactions within the context of BRIAS have continued to amaze me. The fellows of this team came to BRIAS in two groups, one scheduled to arrive early in the program in January and a second group to arrive by mid-March. The first group consisted of Professor Dr. Antonella Pasqualone of the University of Bari in Italy, who is a food scientist and biotechnologist. Professor Dr. Andrea Pironi of the University of Gastronomic Sciences at Polenzo in Italy, who is an ethnobotanist. And Professor Dr. Emeritus Peter Shuri of Rottenstedt Research and the University of Reading, who specializes in wheat chemistry. Unfortunately, due to COVID-related circumstances, Andrea and Peter could not be present in person during the current study season and their visits had to be rescheduled. Yet they have, as much as possible, also participated in the program digitally. And most fortuitously, Antonella and her husband Pino, the ones from the walks that uh, Frank just talked to, talked to us about, uh, were able to participate in person. 
As to events, both Antonella and Peter gave their Brias talks, or signature talks within the Brias program already, while Andrea has had to postpone his for health reasons, but he'll do it in the near future. As to our other activities, early in the program, when we had to focus on online only events, we had a very successful event focused on the past and present of wild plant use, from historical and archaeological samples and examples from ancient Egypt to ethnobotanical examples from Syria during the recent war. Furthermore, we had a most interesting workshop with both fellows and invited international speakers on the concept of upcycling of food waste, in which also ULB team member David Canella participated. In addition, we organized the BRIAS Forum on Food Innovation at this time as well, in which representatives of various companies, including Fermentings from Brussels and Hazel Technologies from the USA, uh, partook, and which was co-organized with Christian Hermans at ULB. If we look at the outputs uh, realized by this subgroup, we may identify a paper with all eight speakers at the food upcycling workshop that is already underway and in which also Annette and David uh, participate, and a paper with the seven speakers at the wild plants workshop that is in concept. And with these fellows together and invited guests, already 19 talks were given in the first parts. As to individual outputs, with Antonella I would like to bring to the fore that we have already started a pilot project on the chemical identification of potential archaeological uh, examples of Arabic gum remains, like you can see at the bottom uh, in the picture. Uh, and we are furthermore exploring a project on the genetic uh, assessment and diversity of uh, processed archaeological olive remains uh, from archaeological contexts. And it furthermore deserves mention that together with Antonella, we are currently planning a shared PhD project on Somali flatbreads that will be hosted at VUB uh, and to be executed here. Beyond that, together with Antonella, we've not only working, been working on exploring the possibilities for setting up an Erasmus exchange program, both at IMDO, at VUB and at CPBL uh, at uh, ULB, but also on writing four additional joint papers. These are on barley waters, bread waste upcycling, olive oil storage and traditional testa breads from Romania. Andrea, we've also been working on several review papers, including some on traditional acorn breads, mixed pulse and cereal foodstuffs, and vegetable pies. In addition, for 2023, we are planning a EU synergy grant uh, proposal, tentatively on traditional plant food use and plant use by ethnic and religious minorities. And this is something in which Antonella will also play a role. With Peter Shuri, who is a leading expert on long-term trends in cereal nutritional composition, we had planned activities on that team and hope to collaborate in relation to the work on ancient crops and their nutritional qualities that we at VUB have developed. Due to COVID-related issues, as I said, Peter could not join us yet, but he will be able to come in the next few months and we then hope to continue uh, with this aspect. The second group of fellows that visited within the subteam and who are here still today with us consists of Dr. Mauro Rizzetto, who is an archaeozoologist at the American School of Classics in Athens, Dr. Philippa Ryan, who is an ethno-archaeobotanist at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, and Professor Dr. Ferran Antolin, who is an archaeobotanist at the Deutsches Archäologisches Institut in Berlin and the University of Basel. In terms of events, during this part of the program, we organized a two-day workshop on food waste and agriculture in Northeast Africa, and yesterday a single-day workshop on the influence of colonialism and imperialism on African food waste. And in each of these activities, also a number of invited international speakers participated. And we also organized, together with Annette Hansen and David Canella, a BRIAS forum on food waste upcycling. And all three fellows gave excellent BRIAS talks. As to group outputs, we are working on a book, a book proposal for an edited book with a major publisher based on the main workshops. While we are also working on a paper within the past, present and future team, in which we ho uh, hope to show how history, archaeobotany and archaeozoology may be helpful in solving modern agricultural and food challenges. 
Lastly, we also started working on preparing an international conference on the epistemology of archaeobotany and archaeozoology to be held in the next few years. Also, a staggering 25 talks were given by the group and invited speakers. With respect to individual outputs, with Ferran we have started on a review paper that is to reconstruct and assess long-term trends in crop selection in the wider Western Mediterranean from the Neolithic until the Middle Ages. And we have already last week written and submitted a small call for a student to do a research internship in this direction through the VUB Talent for Research program. Oops. Yeah. <clears throat> With Mauro, we have worked on a paper that integrates the archaeobotanical and archaeozoological evidence from the archaeological site of Al Qara Al Hamra in Egypt, and we are exploring a co supervised PhD project on Roman processed fish, fo fish foodstuffs. I'm also very happy to announce that Mauro, once he has finished his current Marie Curie project, will be joining us as, at VUB as a postdoctoral fellow on our new EOS project Agros, and will in the meantime already become a member of FOST. Mauro will also play a pivotal role in developing archaeozoology at the new food history lab that the research groups FOST and IMDO are building at VUB. With Philippa, we have been working on an archaeobotanical and historical paper on long-term trends in crop diffusion in Northeast Africa and on a paper on the ethnobotany of Sudan. These will already be presented by us next month at workshops in Cambridge and London. We also started exploring options for joint grant applications. One of the envisioned projects would entail new archaeological and ethnographic fieldwork in Sudan, and the other would look at temporal and geographic diversity in crop nutritional composition using the wide range of samples and specimens in the Kew Gardens Economic Botany Collection. There are, of course, many more fruitful interactions that took place between the fellows on the sub -team, uh, of the subteam themselves, as well with fellows and team members of the other subteams. Uh, with our short staying visitors and guests, and with the researchers at both universities as well. But with this, I hope to at least have given you an impression of some of the activities that were undertaken within this team and some of the outputs this collaborative work is yielding. To me, this is also testament to the great value of the BRIAS program and the effects it can have for all who participated in it and to its enrichment of the academic life at our universities. And therefore, I want to very cordially thank our academic teams, our directors, all of our fellows and participants and our administrator, Annette, for making this wonderful program possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fritz, and congratulations. Congratulations on a successful program. I will be uh, setting up the next presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Nell de Mullenaar from the Vrije Universiteit Brussels, who will talk about her sub-theme, Food Systems and the Green Deal Policies in, in and Beyond Europe. Um, thank you, Nell. Thank you, Annette. So, where do I press? Yeah, uh, this is uh, forward, backward, and then this is the um, uh, little... Okay, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well. Thank you for introducing me. Um, I am history professor at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel and I am the coordinator of this uh, sub team. Um, in this presentation, I will be talking about the relevance of this team, although this is self explanatory, of course, uh, the reasons uh, behind it, the invited fellows, and of course, our outputs. Um, when we were discussing, thinking about possible sub -team teams within the broad and very timely topic, of food, climate change and sustainability uh, with the BRICE directors and the academic directors, I strongly felt that 
although I'm a historian, we need to take the politics of implementing sustainable and climate resilient food systems into account. And we are living in a critical juncture. That's what uh, I think um, Christian said. Yeah, a, a crucial moment in time for European food systems, of course. Um, we are at the start of the most fundamental reform of food policy of at least the last 50 years. And I am, of course, talking about the EU farm to fork strategy, which is part of the Green Deal. The European Commission wants our food systems to be more sustainable, green and climate friendly. And in the years to come, we can expect a series of EU and national policy uh, investments. So this theme connects and reflects on the past of intensification and industrialization and expansion of food production and connects it to present ambitions and goals. And also wants to of, will try to predict how these policies will land, but also be challenged and blocked in the years to come, as we see here illustrating in these two art article headlines. Hence the past, present and future of food, climate and sustainability. But there are two additional reasons why this topic really dovetails, I think, with the mission of Brias. Um, Frank mentioned in his presentation today that Brias wants to be an incubator of, and I, I love that sentence, preferably disruptive ideas, not possibly uh, disruptive ideas, but preferably on themes of societal importance. And what we wanted to do with this team, with this sub team, is uh, to clearly and explicitly make the link to the actual shift in thinking on sustainable food that is currently going on here in Europe and beyond. Even if the focus of our research is often thematic or discipline specific, as you said, uh, Fritz, at the beginning of your presentation, we have the responsibility really to engage uh, in a policy relevant matter that is conceived and will be carried out here in the capital of Europe. Frank also mentioned how Brias will make scientists of different disciplines look over the fence of their research field and cooperate. And looking at food systems as a whole really allows and even requires interdisciplinary collaborations. Uh, this is a topic we can only grasp, only understand fully if we engage with different research domains and areas of expertise, of course. And this is how I thought that the food system cycle looked like when I started out with this uh, topic. As you see, it involves many aspects from livestock, land use, food regulations, transport, consumer concerns and so forth. It really touches many branches of knowledge. Well, during the past three months, I learned that our food systems actually look more like this. <laughs> uh, so, and these are the Brias fellows who learned me that the wonderful researchers and people who made me realize that things are a bit more complicated, <laughs> but also even more encompassing and interesting than I thought. Uh, and the accomplishment uh, of Brias I'm most proud of is that we managed to bring together not only in my team, but also in the other teams, um, a balanced, a really well balanced group of worldwide renowned experts that is truly diverse in terms of gender, geography, in terms of seniority, also very important, uh, and in terms of discipline and expertise. But at the same time, this team was remarkably complementary, covering many aspects of these food systems, many aspects of this, actually. We had Alan Matthews, who is, was called an academic rock star by Brias Fellow. His expertise lies in agricultural <laughs> policy, <laughs> and he's an economist while Pauline, who is an epidemiologist, is more focused on the public consumption and health. Jeroen looks more at the drivers of food system transformation, namely public administration and policy. And Ratana is a climate foresight and scenarios expert in agriculture and food security. She was unfortunately unable to come to Brussels because of COVID measures, uh, but despite the distance, and also the significant time difference because she's in Thailand right now. She was very present and an integral part of the discussions, events and indeed the team. Well, this combination and that of diversity and compatibility really contributed to the success and the productivity of the Green Deal team, as I called it. And during their 
well, three months day, two months and a half, they each gave a BS talk, of course. And we also organized four very successful workshops in terms of topics, participants and audience. We covered many domains, too many to mention here, uh, from food democracy to land use, to consumers concern, to trade policy and so forth. Uh, you can see a few of these topics, uh, but many of you actually participated in these events as well. As well. Uh, what I do want to emphasize is a broad range of speakers in these workshops, and these are just some of the affiliations of the participants in our events. Uh, we involved researchers from the University of, of Oxford, Rostock and Utrecht, but also policymakers of the European Union, uh, the Commission, South Africa, think tanks such as the European Center for Development, Ve Development Policy Management and activists. And that is something that I didn't really realize at the start of at the beginning of the program and was pleasantly surprised about that Bria's fellows do not only bring their knowledge and expertise to the table, but they also uh, bring their network, their scientific network. Uh, so you have a ripple effect of new contacts, of new possible insights and collaborations that will undoubtedly be felt on the long term, as Frank mentioned earlier. But we also have two very short term outcomes that I want to mention. Uh, during their stay, Pauline, Elena, and Jeroen jointly wrote and actually finished, it, it's, it went to the editor um, two weeks ago, uh, a piece, a contribution on the political economy of food system transformation in the EU that will be published by Oxford University Press. And we are organizing a ride shop this month. Uh, this is the last event of the BRIAS Green Team that will result in a brief in collaboration with the Food Agriculture Organization. And last but not least, we produced a few BRIAS babies as well in the Green Team. Uh, this is my daughter, Joan. Uh, she was born last year. And uh, this little... <laughs> this little... She will be happy to have received an applause. She can just, she's just learned to clap actually. So this is very suiting. Um, so she's eight months now. And this little romper Annette kindly sent me while I was in maternity leave um, in October. We'll be going to London actually, because Pauline Schielbeck is expecting a baby any day now. To conclude, I want to express my sincere gratitude uh, to, for this extraordinary and important initiative. Uh, and I am not the first and I will not be the last today to everyone involved. Of course, the fantastic Brias Fellows, but also the rector, the vice rectors of research at VEB and ULB, our wonderful directors Frank and Serge, the academic directors Paul and Christian, and my fellow co-directors David and Fritz. Thank you so much for the pleasant collaboration. And I want to end with a special thanks to Annette. You were not only efficient and proactive, but also really thoughtful and kind. As you see, she sent me this little romper. Uh, and you really went above and beyond to make Brias the success that it was. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. <laughs> Thank you very much now and uh, congratulations on this uh, wonderful sub theme again. Um, just talking to all of the fellows uh, from these different subgroups has been such uh, a pleasure and a really invigorating <laughs> experience. And um, the last uh, presentation of our team members um, talking today is actually by me. <laughs> Uh, the manager of Bria, so I will just uh, set up the last uh, slide here. Okay, almost ready. Here we are. Oops, just put this, put this on the side. Whew. All right, wow. So I want to start by thanking my colleagues, Frank, Christian, David, Fritz, and Nell uh, for their fantastic presentations, as well as uh, Serge and Paul, who could not be with us today, uh, for their monumental contributions to BRIAS. It has been a great pleasure to work with you all in building and shaping this program. As we've heard from the previous talks from our team members, the accomplishments of our spring program are numerous. 
During our spring program this year, we have touched on topics at BRIAS that in terms of discipline can be quite distant from one another. Although they all fit together within our theme, the past, present and future of food, climate and sustainability. BRIAS has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and from around the world to engage with each other to discuss and explore new ideas and new perspectives and perhaps revisit and reevaluate <coughs> older ideas and theories as well. We have explored the science of plants in the universe that lies beneath our feet uh, from a more robust root system that we just saw to designing effective plant vaccines uh, to one day being able to bake bread on Mars. We have delved into the complexities of designing democratic food policy to ensure the access of safe and healthy food for all in the EU and in the world, whilst ensuring sustainable agricultural systems. We have learned that accessing and engaging with more diverse historical and traditional crop cultivars and animal breeds and building more resilient strategies in our food systems can be deeply informed by the insights and technologies of the ancient past and that these things uh, and that these can be employed again in our modern world today all of these things put together form the foundation of what brias is at its core while brias is foremost a scientific institution its vision goes far beyond that brias is a community and that is what we have built here together. Next, I would like to briefly summarize some points of the program from a bird's eye, per, uh, bird's eye view. During our spring program in 2022, we have grown and greatly expanded our reach. Our 28 fellows expertise covers six of the seven continents in the human sciences and natural sciences. We had 24 BRIAS talks from our BRIAS fellows and, um, and guests. We had nine BRIAS workshops and six BRIAS forums, which featured over 50 talks, as we heard earlier, covering a diverse range of topics and expertise. We formed partnerships within Brussels, Europe and worldwide. So far with 36 different universities and scientific institutions, 12 companies and 12 policy centers and institutions. We set up our website and built a uh, social media following on, on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube. And as of today, this morning, uh, we gained even seven more followers. So we're total at 369 followers and on LinkedIn and counting. Um, and our posts, our unique post impressions uh, are about uh, 14,000 uh, per month. Uh, and this is also still growing. On Facebook, we have 205 likes, 235 followers, and again, still counting. Uh, one of our top YouTube videos from one of our Green Deal events actually has over 100 views. Uh, we have participants averaging about 20 to 30 in person and online with some of our top events well beyond 60 participants. Also, our participants were from six of the seven uh, con uh, continents uh, represented. For the morning events, we reach viewers on Eastern Hemisphere in the afternoon and evening events we reach uh, more on the Western Hemisphere. So really, in our first year, Brias is truly a global institution. So, but you know, perhaps next year we'll reach some viewers in Antarctica too. <laughs> going for we're going for seven out of seven. <laughs> Put a little bit in perspective the range of diversity of origins of affiliation of our speakers uh, and fellows. I've plotted this uh, map. So really, really great range and. Um, some points where they are very clustered, of course, Northwestern Europe, or Central Europe, it gets a little bit tiny. Um, these are represented by one point, though that point represents many, many fantastic speakers that we have. This is our reach now, um, and Brias is only beginning. 
I would like to close by talking about our brilliant fellows who all deserve a special word of thanks. We had an exceptional first group of fellows. You all set the bar high for those who follow you. Many of you hadn't been to a conference or event in person for over two years until you joined us here at BRIAS. We began our program during an uncertain moment in the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are grateful you took this leap of faith with us and what a journey it has been. Not all of you could be here with us in person, but nonetheless, you came to events digitally and still gave talks despite a, time, a significant time zone difference. And for, for this, I want to uh, give a special shout out to Natsuko Kobayashi from Tokyo, who gave her Brias talk with a 12 hour time zone difference. So <laughs> thank you so much. I have been to all of the events except a couple, and I've been inspired and invigorated by your drive and determination to make a difference in your fields, beyond your fields and in this world. We prepared a rich and full program for you, which you've heard about today, and you've enthusiastically engaged in it. All of you, in addition to your individual talks, co-organized and spoke in multiple workshops and forums. Beyond that, you began to collaborate, often across disciplines, and publish together, which without a doubt will inspire and shape the next generation of researchers. You did all of this in addition to teaching from a distance, giving exams and participating in uh, PhD defenses and having meetings at your home institutions in different time zones, which is a balancing act and feat that deserves recognition. Though you may uh, return to your home institutions, you will remain Brias Fellows, our first fellows, and you embody our vision of intellectual curiosity, setting new limits in your own fields, and daring greatly to interact and collaborate beyond your disciplines to create novel ideas and tackle society's greatest challenges together. You represent Brias and you will form our legacy. Thank you all. Thanks very much. All right, so um, for our next talk, uh, I will have to download the presentation briefly. I received a little later and oh, USB would be perfect, so uh, we will uh, upload the next presentation and I will set it up um, in, in a moment before introducing our first uh, keynote speaker of the day. Thank you. Just a moment. Okay. Um, you have internet? Yes, yes, this is uh, connected. Uh, may I ask, is it just the top one here? I assume, yes, it is. Okay. Perfect. I will just put them yeah. over here. I am good. This one. And should I hide the slide? Oh, just one moment. A repair. Just one moment. Okay, he doesn't want to read it. Let's just try again. Are you muted?
Annette, you're muted. Thank you, Seth. We've, we've uh, experienced some technical difficulties, so I'm currently downloading uh, the file. We should be up and running shortly, so I will, I will mute myself just, just momentarily. Thank you. That's me. Hey, you made it. How's it going? Hey, Antonella. Hi, Christian. Christopher. Hey. So, who else? Hi. Hi. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we, we are uh, up, and, up and running now, so um, I will share the next PowerPoint. Just one moment, please. So, I didn't want to try. So, this is. Oh, he's not plugged in. Okay. <laughs> it was not you. Okay. He wasn't plugged in yet. Sorry about that. Now give it a try. Ah, yes. Here we Perfect. go. Okay. And our, um, thank you very much uh, for, for uh, your patience with technical difficulties. We are so thrilled to welcome our first keynote uh, speaker, Rashad Al Khafaji, who is uh, the director of the FAO Liaison Office with the European Union uh, and Belgium. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start quickly just by uh, introducing myself. So my name is Rashad Al Khafaji. I've uh, joined the office here in Brussels uh, in September of last year after having worked for nearly 20 years at FAO headquarters in Rome. And um, I'm really thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, first, I think I would go amiss uh, if I don't thank uh, um, the Brussels Institute for Advanced Studies for this invitation. Um, having listened to two of the presentations, three of the presentations now, I'm rather humbled. I hope I will not be boring you with the uh, let's say less science and a little bit more politics governance but uh, i believe that you will see the link between everything that you've been discussing here and between what fao does and why uh, it it matters i will be speaking for a while we will try to also show you some videos about what we do uh, the initiatives that fao does 
and uh, I'm particularly pleased then to have my uh, my my colleague Ratana from uh, FAO Bangkok who is also suffering the time difference uh, as many of our colleagues these days with online meetings are from 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 various parts of the world but she has immediately volunteered with uh, with great enthusiasm to give the second part of of the presentation and to present um, then after me so let me start right away um, just a quick overview what is FAO the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations I think uh, one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations system uh, one uh, it's the the biggest one we consider it uh, it might be interesting to know that it was created a week before the UN <laughs> you know, welcome to the United Nations so this is so so the creation happened and and then when you know in 45 uh, the signature was done and um, we were first located in Washington but moved to Rome in 51. So whoever from you watches the movie Roman Holidays with Audrey Hepburn, please pay special attention to the first three minutes of the movie because she mentions the Food and Agriculture Organization. I think this says it all. This is this is our history basically. Okay, uh, how are we governed? We're governed uh, by our members through the governing bodies. Uh, we have 194 member nations. We have one member organization, and this is particularly relevant being here in Brussels, because the European Union is the only member organization in FAO, but FAO is also the only organization in which the EU is a member organization within the UN system. So it's a very particular relationship. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, we have two associate members, which are the Faroe Islands and Tukilau. Now, uh, we have uh, strategic documents that guide our work. Uh, these are, uh, we will talk about the strategic framework because this is a 10 year document that countries agree upon that endorses the vision of how FAO will work in the coming 10 years. And as you all know, um, you know, we have eight more planting seasons until 2030. So this, these 10 years are of particular uh, importance. We also have a medium term plan that gets in a rolling way adjusted, as well as obviously a program of work and budget that is on a biannual uh, basis. <clears throat> now, the director general uh, was elected in uh, June of 2019. He took office in the beginning of August. And um, this was the fanfare for the election, apparently. <laughs> so, um, you know, his, his, his aim was uh, to to build a dynamic FAO uh, that is needed in this world. Uh, I remember reading in one of Oxfam's reports some time ago uh, saying that if FAO didn't exist, we would need to invent it now. So there is a, a real necessity for this organization, um, but with a view on uh, the original mandate and aspirations and the mission of the organization. This uh, was then taken over into the FAO strategic framework um, which was approved by the highest body, the governing body of the organization, which is the FAO conference in July of 2021. Now, <clears throat> the, the framework, and I will talk a little bit about it now, you can already start with the main hook of it, so to say, which is how can FAO contribute to helping countries achieve the SDGs? This is, this is basically the common goal uh, that we have. And uh, there is a, an absolute belief that the SDGs that are related to FAO's work, so uh, eliminating poverty and eliminating hunger, are in reality a basis for the other SDGs that you uh, that you see then the other 17 that are there. Um, the FAO strategic framework is built around four betters. What do we mean by that? Um, we have four betters that we want to use, which are better production, better nutrition, better environment and a better life in order to ensure that we have a transformation of the agri-food systems. And we want to have these agri-food systems become more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient and sustainable. Now, uh, when you hear better production, nutrition environment, that is a bit of a, let's say, a global and a, and a, and a vast uh, definition, but um, each one of them, and you will see later on, has a direct link to the actions that FAO does. And the, 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 uh, the point of defining better production and better environment within the same kind of goals is, is to a certain extent revolutionary because so far we had on one hand the environmental 
uh, aspect. On one hand, we had the production. So you were either worried about feeding the world that is constantly growing in population. We have to set a table for approximately 10 billion people for the year 2050. And on the other hand, we had the environmental approach, which is reconstructing our ecosystems, maintaining or safeguarding biodiversity. So all the environment approach. This is a way where you will see this strategic framework is, is combining this. It is adding to it also the element of nutrition, which for many years has not been so much in focus. Uh, countries and policy makers were thinking too much in terms of calories. But we are now absolutely certain that what this leads to is at the end of the day malnutrition in many forms. And the most uh, Kafkaesque way of looking at it, if you want to, is countries where you have both ends of malnutrition. So you have uh, obese and, uh, and, and overweight people with all the um, uh, uh, diseases that come with it, and you have actual hunger and, and undernourishment with all what it comes with it from stunting and child development and so on. Um, that that is the the let's say the 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 overview of the strategic framework. I wanted to give you a, a definition of the agri-food systems because uh, I believe that this is really something. <clears throat> the, the systemic view and this holistic approach that we are trying to have within all what we are doing now at FAO is fundamental to understand the, the connections that we have. And I think uh, we, we heard uh, just and we saw actually this amazing slide that I definitely want a copy of because it really <laughs> it really is, is, is fantastic. It shows you exactly how linked all these elements are. So, so the agri-food system is obviously, you know, this whole journey of the food. Uh, from tillage to table, so if, if that uh, sounds very, very close to farm to fork, it, it is because it's the same vision behind it. Uh, it is basically from planting, growing, harvesting, processing, storing, transporting, packaging, everything that food goes through until even the moment uh, where we have it on, in, in, our, in our homes. And uh, this links obviously very strongly to a concept that FAO is working on uh, uh, with a strong focus, which is food loss and waste. And, and, and if you think about it, this is why we put disposed off, because we do know that nearly a third of everything that is being produced in this world is being either lost, which is from production until it reaches supermarket or caterer, or wasted, which is basically then on our shoulders as consumers a third approximately. And when you compare that uh, to the 800 and something million uh, that are hungry uh, today, it is not only an ethical grave problem, but it is also an ecological and economic one. And, and that is that is where why you, you will see this disposed of here as an important element. <coughs> why do we say agri-food and not food systems? Because we add to it non-food products that are strongly related to the world of the agricultural uh, um, uh, rural area, where these two, um, let's say, categories are strongly combined. So this is the non-food products uh, that are there. Going back to the strategic framework, uh, now you uh, saw me talk about the four betters, and you will see the the four, yeah. So you will see the four betters here, and. Next to them, it is my apologies, it's not too visible. Those are for those of you who have had that poster of the SDGs already uh, in their offices for long enough, you will recognize the, the symbols. Uh, these are basically the SDGs that are directly linked to each of these four betters. What you see in here are the, the programmatic priority actions that FAO takes for under each of these elements. So uh, if I take better nutrition, we are talking about healthy diets for all. We're talking about ensuring nutrition for the most vulnerable, food safety, food loss and waste that I have just mentioned, as well as markets and trades. All actions that FAO does under that, under that better, so to say, fall within that category of enforcing this. What do we have on the bottom? We have basically uh, our, our facilitators, the strengthening, that these are the matters that we need in order to have all of these actions here take place. So innovation, technology, data, and complements, and in complements you have the financial matters, you have uh, human resources, you have knowledge, etc. Obviously, this is all based on a strong focus on gender, youth, and the inclusion, because what, again, coming back to the fact that we want to have inclusive agri-food systems, which is uh, fundamental here. Now, uh, 
Strategic framework is accompanied also with strategies. One of them is already adopted, which is the FAO strategy on biodiversity. So here in that column, what you see are the aims of this strategy that has already been adopted by member countries. We are now in the, in the stage of, on one hand, mainstreaming the concepts that are in the strategy into all that FAO does, but also helping countries to ensure that on a national level, this is also implemented. In discussion currently, and you know there's always discussion in the UN system, so in the preparation now, you have the FAO strategy on climate, as well as the FAO strategy on science and innovation. Uh, why those two? Because clearly, I mean, the, the concept that we see, and if you have followed COP or CBD uh, meetings recently, you will see agriculture is not only uh, one of the uh, reasons of climate change, but it needs to be also part of the solution. And the only way to do that is to integrate the concerns and the, and the, and the thinking of the agricultural side into the discussions about climate change. And, and therefore, this is absolutely important to have. Uh, it links, of course, also with the strategy on science and innovation, because if we want to go, going back to the four betters, thinking, for example, about better production, better production cannot mean like uh, in the 17th, a green revolution. We do not have these fields. We do not have these natural resources. So it can only go through innovation. And this innovation can be, of course, a technical one, but it can also be innovation of processes, innovation of thinking, and therefore that concept of scientific approach and innovative approach needs to be strongly backing all of what we are trying to do here. Um, I'm going now quickly to the FAO uh, office here in Brussels. So basically we were established in uh, 1997. Uh, we are the liaison office formally with the European Union and its institutions and Belgium. Uh, we do assist in ensuring what we consider ourselves sort of a bridge between all these institutions and FAO. Uh, not, not the easiest of tasks when you know how many activities are happening on both sides. Yet a very easy task, on the other hand, because you see how much interest there is from both sides to ensure that expertise, uh, policymakers get the good advice, uh, but also from FAO side to listen to what are the, uh, let's say, priorities, what, are the, what is the thinking on, on, on the side here. Um, we are, of course, also a brand ambassador of the organization in, in the sense that we ensure that FAO is present when it comes to discussions that are of relevance to the organization and to its members. We, we, we tried to reflect a little bit on the partners that we have because our title says EU and Belgium, but when you go a little bit deeper, we come a little bit closer to the slide in, in the terms that there are so many partners that we work with. And, and uh, this goes from uh, the civil society, think tanks, academia, but also, for example, the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States that is here in Brussels and that represents 79 members in the ACP countries. Highly important uh, as a framework if you want to have any sort of a policy discussion. This is a framework that is here in the city, so it is absolutely useful to use it. Of course, the European Commission with the various directorate generals with which we work. So not only INTPA, the old DEFCO, but also ECHO for emergencies, climate, uh, clima, uh, santé, uh, you know, the, 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 the palette is wide. Um, of course, also the European <laughs> Parliament, uh, we have an alliance. So parliamentary alliances is an idea that, that was created uh, in Latin America, where the first one was created. Now we have several around the world, but we have one here for the European Parliament. So it's a parliamentary alliance against hunger and malnutrition. It's basically to also reflect a little bit that the matters of hunger and, 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 and combating uh, hunger have no political uh, color to it. It is something that should be across all of the parliamentary fractions. Um, this is a little bit where we are working. You will see uh, that in addition to Belgium, we have Flanders here because we do have with Flanders a, a, a partnership uh, agreement. Flanders is, uh, is also contributing to FAO projects, but we also are working on, um, for example, we have a Flemish trainee program at the office, so we always have young uh, students that come and, and, and work uh, with us. Lola, who is with us, for example, she, she was one of them. Now she has moved uh, to our staff, but, but and I have a number of these colleagues that I'm very happy and very proud to have. So we have a number of, of, of uh, uh, interactions there. 
Uh, of course, Belgium also at the federal level is a very important partner of FAO, uh, helping a lot in one element that is of extreme importance to us, which is flexible funding, uh, where, where the idea is to really uh, sit together in a partnership agreement and see where is this money needed and what can be do done with it. Now, um, I want to jump back to FAO science and innovation for the reason that when I looked at the topic of the theme of, of your uh, uh, session here, I think this idea of past, present and future is, is extremely important. And I think our future is directly linked to science and innovation. I mean, this is what the future has to look like. It is a, a, a driving force for us, both innovation and science. Um, in, in With the arrival of our new director general, this focus on science was even increased, him himself being a, a scientist. And so he established for the first time in the organization a chief scientist position uh, that, that uh, we, have, uh, we have now filled since 2020. Uh, I'm particularly very proud that we have a, 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 a female chief scientist, somebody from uh, uh, North Africa. So somebody who really comes also with a lot of, uh, let's say, the global vision that is required for this. We also have a new FAO Office of uh, on Innovation. So uh, you see that there is quite a strong push for this this idea of innovation and 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 and, and uh, providing the best available scientific advice to our our countries in their policy decisions. Uh, we also have FAO awards that acknowledge all the process that goes with the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, there are the Champion Award and the Partnership Award. And after the layer of the, uh, let's say, uh, strategic framework, you have the layer of the in initiatives, so the action that is taken. And our flagship uh, initiative is the Hand in Hand initiative. It is a matchmaking uh, process where countries are linked to partner donators, uh, donors and to other entities uh, by, uh, via a system of identifying the most suitable uh, combinations of partnerships. And I think the, the best way to explain this is if I, I don't know if I will click just now directly on the video, we should be good to go, no? <laughs> Thank you. 
I wonder how we can. There you go. We can. I think we opened uh, just one or two mm -hmm. windows. So I'm going to close that. Yes, here we are. Are we, are we still sharing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. Oops. I think I'm coming down. Thank you very much. OK, um, what you saw is is the concept of the hand in hand initiative. It it builds very strongly on uh, the the data that is available and it gives a regional uh, approach where you see all connected data. And this is the this is the the, 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 the let's say the the nucleus. The importance of this initiative is that it links all of the data available for a specific region within a country, a sub-region, and it provides policymakers, but also donor partners with a, a new view of what is happening there. Because just from our side, just from FAO side, um, you know, we have 20 technical units who are providing their data, who have until now been doing this, but doing it very much in, a, in an isolated manner. Now it is looked at from a regional perspective, from a geographical perspective. So you have, uh, as is mentioned here, you know, animal health, trade, markets, uh, we have soil data, we have fisheries data, livestock, crops. Um, it's, it's a very vast uh, area of, of, uh, of information. Uh, the, 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 the layers that we have now uh, include thousands of statistics series. We have about 4,000 metadata uh, records that are in there. One million geospatial layers and this is uh, available this is open you know this is not in the hands of anybody it's it's, it's everybody's data obviously the open data that that countries are uh, supporting fao and organizations are providing to integrate into this database and is it is absolutely fantastic to look at i encourage you to to have a look at this uh, it's it's available and you can choose an area and then you see what information is there available about it and and even for the scientific community it's of extreme importance because you you can analyze and you can find links that that are um let's say quite interesting so i will uh, go to the next initiative that we have which is the green cities initiative again uh, the concept, we all know about it, it's the idea of, uh, you know, what is a green city? A green city is not a city where you have a couple of parks, but it's a city where in the concept, in the governance of the city, you are thinking about short transportation ways for your food. You are thinking about minimizing food loss and waste. You are thinking about an uh, uh, urban agriculture. You're thinking about beekeeping in your city. You're thinking about all the elements that create an actual green city. And this is this is where uh, where I think the next um, uh, idea uh, comes from, which is we have to start with very concrete ideas about this. So there are uh, cities that have joined this initiative, uh, some of them in Africa, where, where we started with the first projects. The concept is to increase this uh, over the years and ensure that we have uh, you know this cross pollination that you were talking about a little bit in in the thought in the thinking, so that we have a forum for best practices, that we have the lessons learned shared, because at the end of the day, and this is uh, you will see this as a red line through a lot of what uh, this presentation is about, our problems are very similar. We might be in different degrees of development, but we are facing very similar uh, issues around the globe. And this is why uh, it is important to have these international fora for that. So I will now again try and open the next video.
Very well. Um, the next initiative that I want to talk about, which is the 1000 Digital Villages, uh, combines in it several elements that are very much future oriented and very much in line with, with what you were discussing before here. So it is on in one hand, it's a precise, it is an initiative that tries to show how rural areas can benefit from digital technologies. <laughs> and this goes beyond the agricultural uh, aspect. Uh, think about medical insurance, uh, con education, all could be linked uh, in rural areas. And also, again, uh, you can take any of our regions even in, in Europe and you will see that uh, rural migration to cities is an issue. Uh, you can see that linking uh, rural areas to technology, to uh, digital technology is a matter of interest even in, 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 in Europe and of course even more in other areas of the world. So uh, the, this digital village uh, uh, concept is, is one where we are having the uh, regional office for Asia and the Pacific uh, piloting it in the Southeast Asian area. And from there it started, but you see that there is a strong focus on Southeast Asia also because there is already a lot of work uh, happening in that area there. Um, the, the videos that you will see will, will highlight various aspects of it. Because one is, uh, when we talk about digital agriculture as such, why could digital agriculture be of, of, of uh, benefit? And that's what you will see in Mongolia. Uh, what is the link to uh, rural agritourism? Which is, again, something that is of extreme importance if you think about the post-COVID area. We are not trying to go back to a normality where people fly thousands of miles around the world. Uh, to, 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 and, and most probably this will only come in a very slow way. But we have uh, this concept of agritourism where you are combining between uh, areas that are closer to where tourists are and also the production and uh, introducing them to the lifestyle of, of uh, uh, an agricultural environment, the rural environment with all the benefits that it has. You will see that in the Dominican Republic and you will see something about how Bangladesh is dealing with the issue of uh, digital villages in the first video. Let me quickly add to this that in traditional uh, societies, like for example in Bangladesh, we see a tremendous effect of digital agriculture on the empowerment of women because of the fact that this is much more of an independent uh, access that you can have from home, but you're still working on something. So uh, it, it, it leapfrogs also in many other ways that are really of importance to sustainable development in general.
Maybe just to mention here quickly is the fact that we're talking about simple technological aspects. So this is something that is done with a mobile phone, with an average tool that everybody has. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who was talking about WhatsApp, using WhatsApp just as we use it in our daily life, but they are able to really create, especially in, in, in the post-COVID uh, uh, world, a network of, of buyers and sellers that can communicate through tools that are available already. This is why technology has moved and we need to make sure that farmers consider also this mobile phone as, as a tool, as an agricultural tool for them. I mean, this is this is a little bit the concept behind that. In, in the Mongolia video, you will see how this can also be used in the national governance. So really uh, on a much wider scale. With these examples, you, you have seen that the that the concept of digital agriculture is already quite applied. And this is, I think, the, the, the message from all these videos. On various layers, there is already quite a change happening. It is, of course, our uh, role also to see how these best practices and how these uh, experiences can be shared and can be becoming also, you know, humanity's, let's say, common uh, uh, knowledge base. Speaking of knowledge, FAO is also a, a, a fundamental part of it is the knowledge organization is exactly that is this uh, promotion of all the knowledge that we have. So a few numbers here on one hand about publications, 
you know, we we um, we had about uh, in 2021 about nearly 10,000 total publications and documents that were issued. Uh, we have in the document repository of FAO about 115,000 documents. And remember, all of this is accessible. It's free and it's there for everybody to use. So it's a huge amount of knowledge uh, that is at your disposal. <coughs> Uh, we also have Faustat, which is the uh, statistic part of FAO's work, covering the entire globe, and, and uh, it's been doing data collection since 1961. So again here, trends, uh, status of situation of, of, of various, uh, you know, crops, livestock, forestry, fishery, uh, you will find a, a wealth of information there. On a periodical basis, FAO also issues flagship publications that are considered fundamental for research in the in the various areas, but also used very strongly by policymakers and decision makers. We added here the ones that are coming up. So on the 2nd of May is the State of the World's Forests 2022. This we, we call them by these by these abbreviations. So SOFO, SOFIA, SOCO. And SOFO comes out this year because we have the World Forestry Congress taking place in uh, Korea and the Republic of Korea. And this is where the, uh, the uh, document will be launched. But we also are aiming to have launches here in Brussels with our partners for these various documents where we hope to always have an expert provide us with a, a let's say, an, a, a summary of the main findings that are of importance and hopefully always have also a possibility to have an exchange and a Q&A about the various documents that you see here. Part of our work, as I said before, is to work with our partners here in, in Brussels and uh, our outreach to the academic and research institutions is extremely important in that. We've just re recently organized a, a roundtable of academic institutions with FAO in Rome, and we had uh, 26 institutions that were showing us plenty of really interesting work that is ongoing or where we are going to even strengthen that. Uh, we have a formal approach, which is the Memoranda of Understanding, but even before that, we can partner on various uh, specific issues and more than happy to always discuss these. From our Brussels office here, we have also the communication and outreach element that, that I would like to highlight. So we have a, a, our website, we have a newsletter that comes out every month. Uh, we have our Brussels Dialogues, which is an invention that we created at the beginning of the pandemic, where we organize uh, Zoom events, uh, usually opened by a high level political uh, segment. And then we have a technical uh, side to it. Um, we also have all kinds of outreach material and campaigns that we do uh, with various partners here in Brussels. This is our, our contact here. I, I would be very, very pleased to you know answer any uh, queries you have on collaboration that we can do together. Um, and I thank you very much for uh, the attention. So I don't know if there are any specific questions that you want to ask me now, or if we want to wait uh, for my colleague Ratana to also provide her input. It's it's I'm I'm in your hands. We can start with some uh, yeah. questions from okay. the room. Okay. Sure. Hello. Thank you so much for the magnificent presentation. Uh, I was wondering uh, how. Food security is becoming more prominent now with Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, of course, and if the calories you mentioned are becoming uh, more important in the equation and the short term uh, food security threats that the Ukraine crisis might bring uh, to Europe. Well, you will find on our web page a number of, of documents already analyzing the, let's say, um, secondary effects. Of, of, of the war. Uh, there you will find uh, what it uh, means for markets, for uh, global prices. 
because as you know, both the Russian Federation and Ukraine are major exporters of uh, uh, food items, but also the effect that it has on energy prices, the effects that it has on fertilizers, because again, very important element. And some of these issues, you see FAO is, uh, is, uh, is analyzing them and looking at them, but it is also a matter of, of, of following the trends and understanding what the effects will be. So it is a, the predictability is not the easiest. But for instance, a very logical consequence, if fertilizers become more expensive, a lot of farmers all around the world will not use them. So what it will mean is that you will have a decrease in the yield in a year or two or even three years. So there are these long term effects that we are certainly uh, uh, going to look at. And we have uh, uh, we had a, uh, um, a technical brief here in, in, in Brussels by our chief economist uh, just a week ago, where basically, again, this was this was the topic. The issue is, you know, how do we look at these long term effects, prices? Uh, export possibilities because it it is one thing you see uh, in in that region the food is available it's a matter of accessibility because of what is happening no because it's one thing that you have the food in your stock it is the other is the accessibility Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, are there any other questions from the room? Thank you very much. Thank you for our presentation. The European Union is now for uh, regulations, regulation and more regulations. We also heard about the food waste, uh, 30 or 40 percent. Are regulations increasing or decreasing food waste? That's a good question. Probably we need somebody from the EU to answer about their side. But I can tell you that our aim is more raising awareness making it uh, a second nature to us to realize what is happening with food waste and food loss. And my personal uh, um, point in this that I really try to always make is we need to start with the youngest. It needs because there is there is one thing that has happened traditionally. If you look at traditionals, uh, you will see that the respect of food and uh, the avoiding to have it lost and wasted was intrinsic it it existed in all traditional societies you have this but then we had i assume as part of industrialization we sort of split away from the production from how food is made to just finding it in a supermarket and so we do have now the issue of making sure that the young generation realizes you know first of all for me a number that i hear from our our nutrition specialist that always uh, fascinates me is that you can approximately count that uh, for every calorie that we eat there's a liter of water that was used to produce it so so when you throw away you're not only throwing away the energy that was used for it and the raw material and the, but you're also throwing away water and in the thousands because if you think that we are supposed to eat about 2000 calories a day that means we're eating 2000 liters of water as well but if we throw some part of that away so the i i'm not sure about how the regulations is is maybe a, a political issue more than anything else or a governance issue but i think that what is needed is to bring the logic back the the become make it a, a common sense issue and of course there are uh, technical ways of doing it. For example, I'm absolutely fascinated by the apps that are now used. And, and, and I had uh, here in, in, in Brussels a talk with one of the inventors of one of them, where you could basically write into your app that you have a kilo of, of tomatoes uh, that you are not going to use. And it shows in your, uh, in your area where you could drop them or who could pick them up. And it is, it is very logical that in reality this could happen. And, and uh, probably also in, in a smaller village uh, that it is much more natural to go to your neighbors and say, do you need this as we don't? But it's something that clearly we have to adapt to our modern way of living. That's clear. Another element, just to be very fair, is also, of course, this is not only a matter of rich and poor. Because of the traditions that are exist in some countries, uh, your, your hospitality and your generosity is to show that you are offering more than the guest can eat. And, and as a half Arab, I can tell you long stories about this. And when you try to point that out and say, look, there's no need because there are only three people coming. We don't need to cook for 10. It is still a cultural issue. So, so, so this is again a matter where young people would might be even more receptive to understanding the importance and the gravity of it. When you think 30% of what we're producing, 800 and so million people hungry, there is a big issue here that we need to tackle. Yeah. Yes. I'm not an academic, I'm just an architect. Um, so I'm 
that um, you mentioned just now at the end of this, of this uh, afternoon water. Uh, this FO is involved, is involved with uh, huge problems that are coming of the melting of the ice and all the water is coming from the ice parts for Asimfal. How are you involved with that? Is there scientists in your groups too that uh, study this? Okay, um, what I am aware of is, of course, that we are dealing a lot with water scarcity in areas like the dry corridor in Latin America or the uh, Sahel countries or all of the Near East and, and Northern Africa areas. There are regional initiatives that FAO is doing in collaboration with the countries about it. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of work that is done on uh, the statistical side of water. So we have um, quite a number of databases that work on it uh, that I am happy to, to share with you some links about where colleagues are working on it. Now, if they are looking precisely on how melting uh, water, let's say uh, snow that becomes water is, is affecting this, I would have to check with colleagues. I'm more than happy than to provide you with the information. But water, obviously, as a, as a fundamental part of the agricultural system is very central to what, what FAO is doing indeed. Thank you very much for this very interesting and invigorating presentation. Uh, I liked also what you were saying about the issue of attitudes, because that was also one of the things that we found in one of the workshops that we did on food upcycling, when we looked at traditional societies and people in the past, that it was far less natural to them to uh, to waste, and that a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, very naturally and organically, people who are upcycling already. Um, what I now wonder is, will you also study what the uh, effects are of, for instance, the current price increases? And because often there's a sense of also necessity uh, behind the idea of, of, of attitudes of being more uh, sparingly. And with the, the, uh, the food price is now going up. Do you think that will have an immediate effect on the reduction of waste? It's a very good question. I mean, I hope I hope that some academic study on it would be done because it's really something that that would really, especially in the various, let's say, in the different situations societies are in. One thing that that is clear is that when prices of food increase, what we see, for example, is that there's a tremendous negative gender effect. Women are usually the ones who are the last to have the healthy meal in the house across societies. And this is really a very, very important element, especially in those areas where you have, uh, let's say, vulnerable uh, part of society being quite high. Because what does that mean? That means that at the end of the day, it is not only about, as we said, it's not only the calories, it's, it's, it's also the, the nutrients and the healthy diet. And if that starts to decrease or be jeopardized, there's an, a, a gender angle, angle there that is extremely important to highlight. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. It was a very nice presentation. First of all, Rota from Roma. I was going to be very excited. Piacere. I think I might ask you a question in Italian, but I forgot about the answer in English. I mean, every time I look at the yes, of course, we have to be able to produce food for 10 billion people by 2050. Yes. By looking at the number that we also analyze here, I'm not so scared because actually we're already producing it and, and throwing it away. Yeah. That's, that's what I have to <laughs> usually tell people, it's like, guys, we are introducing. What probably scares me is that this willingness of reaching these 10 billion, uh, let's say, food for 10 billion people by selecting certain kind of, only certain kind of cereals or certain kind of, uh, let's say, variety of, uh, of plant. I mean, do you have any idea or there is any science that, I mean, people are already not the producers. Food producers are already not only doing this, selecting only few varieties because they are afraid that we not be able to produce enough food by using other kind of uh, less valuable varieties. So this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I fully agree with you on the first part. Yes, indeed, we are producing what is needed. It's a matter of efficient. It's a matter of solidarity. It's a matter of, you know, distributing it in in the world in the right way. On the other part, uh, I know that FAO has done quite a, a big and solid work on diversity of food and how this diversity is decreasing. And it's a historical matter that you can see. And I, I know I was uh, recently here in a, in a, in a, in a, in a market where, where they were showing 
uh, what what I then understood is called forgotten foods. So you have really fruits and, and kinds even of apples and pears and so on that just are not used anymore. I don't know if the if there is a planned or that, that there is a programmatic approach how this happened or if it's just simply a matter of at some point calculating that there is more return on this kind of fruit and then this fruit is used and the other one is used less, less, less and less. But I know that we have quite a, a, a solid uh, body of work on food diversity and uh, I know that our director general uses this quote quite often that for biodiversity we need to increase food diversity and that food diversity is is and it's also very regional huh? it's it's very interesting because I can tell you uh, colleagues from Southeast Asia that would come to Rome for example uh, would ask about cucumbers and we would show them where they are and they say no other ones and we would say no those are the ones we have and they say oh but those are for a salad and we need those that you cook or those that so regionally you do have this diversity but it is not all over and indeed it is needed all over okay we'll take uh, one more question and then Please. go to our next speaker sure presentation. Uh, I was curious uh, when I was watching the video about the Dominican Republic that you were using WhatsApp to sell their products. Uh, I have seen to an extent something similar in my hometown, especially during COVID when the stores were closed and people were uh, actually, my mother, for instance, was selling via WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And I saw that that actually, uh, in a matter of a year, improved the local economy a lot. But I was wondering, uh, from what I understood from your organization, you're more interested in like reducing food waste and well, basically optimizing what David was saying, for instance. So I was curious because I only see the local effect and I can maybe imagine that this has a reduction in CO2 because you don't have to ship it somewhere else. Is there anything else that I'm missing for which this is actually advantages on top of local economy or it's just that, right? You can, you can add to this, for example, school feeding programs because this is also something if you integrate uh, what is needed for schools for school meals into the local production and you also have that communication way of knowing where there is what produced and how they could buy it for the cheapest price you're increasing the probability that you have children going to schools because often in very in many areas and this was one of the effects of covid that was devastating and not that much talked about is you had many areas of the world where uh, the only nutritious hot meal of the day a child gets was at a school and so by by that not being there because schools being closed you took that away so this is another element of of what you were saying and don't us uh, underestimate in my opinion you know the tremendous effect that does have to the local economies and what that of course also means then nationally uh, i i in my in my previous job as as attache in the cabinet of the director general i remember that that we visited a small island development state and, and they were, the, the national uh, coordinators, they were telling us that one of the biggest issues that they're trying to do is convince all the hotels not to import, you know, butter from uh, overseas and, and, and some speciality because they're a five-star hotel and they want to offer their tourists everything that they're used to back home. Uh, instead, you know, to show them what, what is there, the richness and the, uh, the bountifulness of what they have in the region there or around, just in the islands around the, the touristic location. So there is a lot that can be done in that way there. No? No, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, I think we want to give a round of applause. Thank no, you. thank you very much. Pleasure. So you are now connecting. Very good. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Um, we will now ask um, our our next. Uh, next speaker to to share her screen with us. Um, she's returning to us again. She's our fellow, uh, Dr. Ratana Pio Norbert Mans uh, at Utrecht University is a part of the Copernicus Center and also the FAO Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific. So uh, welcome Ratana. Um, Please uh, turn on your camera, un unmute your microphone and um, share with us. Um, we cannot hear you at this moment. Oh, I'm not oh. talking yet. 
but I am now. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wonderful. Welcome, Ratana. Welcome back. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Annette. Sorry. Okay. So just checking the video is on, the mic is on, and I hope that my screen is shared. Yes, please. And turn that microphone uh, volume all the way up, please. Oops. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, perfect. Thanks so much. Great. Um, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, is Ratana. I'd like to thank uh, Annette, but especially as well uh, Nell, uh, Professor Nell, um, as I was one of the fellow under her sub team. Um, big thank you as well to Mr. Rashad uh, for introducing FAO, its mandate and the multiple framework that speak to the team, uh, the first team of the BRIAS Fellowship. Um, I know that I'm the last kind of obstacle before uh, the, the official reception, so I will just take 10 minutes uh, to reflect a little bit more. Um, I'm lucky enough to say that I have two hats here, um, holding the hat of uh, FAO, but as well as one of the first um, fellow of the BRIAS Fellowship. Saying that is um, saying again, big thank you to all of the organizer and the BRIAS Fellowship. Uh, being able to be integrated to such a program that look at past, present and future of food system have been extremely uh, interesting, allowing me to reflect um, and especially to think in a more interdisciplinary way and I, and I think this is quite uh, important for those that don't know what I do. I mean, my mother doesn't know yet what I'm doing as well. <laughs> I've been trying for the last 15 years to explain, um, especially when you explain her that you think about the future <laughs> and she's like, what is it to learn about the future, right? Um, at least when you're an historian, you can say I'm learning from the, the past. There is something that is written about the past, but learning from the future and especially when you are Asian is extremely difficult to make your parents be aware that it's actually could be your career. So allow me to guide a couple of reflections related to uh, my work and as well um, the foresight work that I do. So for those that thought that I was going to have a kind of keynote play is that was going to close uh, that amazing fellowship. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen with me. Uh, I'm just going to look at more an opening. And when we think about opening and really, Annette, I really like your presentations because talking about BRIAS as a global institutions, talking about BRIAS as making a difference, having that novel idea and building that legacy, it, it's something that really took. And I think that not only for me as a, as a fellow, but I think for many of the fellow that have been joining forces under this first BRIAS fellowship. We talk already about it and again, Rashad explained it very well and many questions that the presentation received was really focusing on that. Allow me just to get again to that point and, and quote Axel Randall. The world produce enough food to provide every man, woman and child with more than 2300 calories per day, which is more than sufficient. However, poverty and inequality structured by class, gender, race and the impact of colonialism have resulted in unequal access to earth and bounty. And I think this is very important to repeat and repeat again. And maybe for us who are all in this room and for those that are in the, the, the digital room, it's time to really think in an honest way what type of society and what type of global world are we living? Is it really a society of need, of demand, of greed? And I think I have been really through different inspiring talk from my colleagues and my fellow where we were talking about unintended consequences of, of climate policy, of food policy. We're talking about past lessons and what can we learn for today lessons. And I think again, it's not a time for us, not in 2022, um, to give up. It's not a time for us to think that we cannot address those roots problem or those root cause. It's not time for us to be pessimistic. 
And, and I think that over the last 10 years, shifting to a career of political scientist to be more a futurist was my only way uh, to not hate human, I think. Um, and exploring transformative future, that, that's what I do. And that's what I do on the FAO, where um, the climate um, scenario foresight specialist in the FAO Regional Office of Asia and Pacific, which is a really new position. And what I talk uh, about, well, actually, we talk about plausible future. We talk about how we can transform futures. What can we learn about the future? And for those that are not familiar about foresight planning, foresight planning is really about learning from the past because we do trend analysis, we do horizon scanning, but it is really looking at future trends, future driver of change, look at early signal and how can those already help us to take better decision today for the future in a short term, in a mid term and in a long term. So when I talk about exploring transformative future, that echo not only the, the work of the fellow, but as well within BRIAS and a, a collaboration with, with FAO is really identifying the strategic partnership. As Mr. Rashad was saying, like strategic partnership doesn't mean it's just institution. You can have a strategic partnership with youth because they are role, they are change agents and they are the future change agents as well. Um, I have been very inspiring by different uh, talk, including from Pauline from I mean, I'm not going to start uh, naming some of the fellow, but uh, the promotion of system thinking was really one of the key driver of the talk. And, and, and again, I, I mean, this is extremely important to think about complex system and promote that system thinking, understanding that you have to connect the dots, that you are not working in a vacuum and that your learning, your experience, your actions, the decisions that you're going to take and how you want that to shape the future of the food system and the future of agriculture needs to be think in connection. We're not in a world of a vacuum. Build new skill and data analytic. Um, I think that echo a lot different um, initiatives that they found when and others have about how much data can be provided currently. Um, I read a report recently it was saying that 99% of the data related to uh, climate have been produced over the last five years, which is very scary when we say it like that. All right, so what do we mean exactly? Do we have, now that we have data, do we have the analytics? Do we have the skill to read those data, to take better decision making? I'm not going to respond to that because that would be more a personal statement of mine, but I'm sure that all of the researcher, professor, um, all of the experts, all of the fellow that are here today have already thought about what is data governance, what is good information, what is effective communications. And it is again a very important moment of the time of our world to think data, knowledge and science for action. Now, accelerating good governance and good practice. I think this is a very important um, area to explore when we think about transformative future. It's not that we don't have enough food, it's that the food that we have is not enough distributed. Now, there is many layer of those causal obstacle or challenges. And again, many of the fellows that have been participating to the BRIA's first fellowship have been highlighting successfully all of those driver of change and all of those limited um, barrier that we can identify, not only in Europe, but in Asia and in, across the globe. So if I look at again, and um, I come from a very kind of different type of discipline. I know Nell, when the first time I met her, she was like, I'm an historian. <laughs> and I was like, I'm a futurist. All right, we're going to meet somewhere which, which is the present and we're going to really look at what can be done, what can be learned and how can this knowledge can really infuse better decision making. In my vocabulary, we call that the no regret options. When I'm building scenario with governments, when we are identifying driver of change of the food system, we are looking at pathway of sustainable, resilience food system where 
the policymaker can really look at no regret options. And I think it's again a very important moment where we need to be very honest with policymaker. Both of our data and modeling are not perfect science. It's here to guide. And when we say guiding, it's really looking at plausible future, plausible options. There is not a zero risk option. It doesn't exist. And it would be silly to think that it exists because any of our decision making process never had to request a 100% science. And it's the same for the food system. When Rashad was talking about, you know, the preference, the culture, this is not science. So a lot of points have been already raised by my, um, by my, by my previous uh, fellow and, and as well Rashad, but again, allow me to really emphasize about why it matters. And I mean, why it matters in Asia, for example, I mean, I'm not talking about um, Europe, but in Asia, I'm sure you know that Asia agriculture is the largest user of natural resources, which occupy about 40% of the world total land area. But no, not only that, we are withdrawing 70% of the renewable freshwater resources. In a very quick note, farming is, or agriculture, is really the key source of sink of greenhouse emissions. So we're not talking about adaptations only, we're talking about mitigation only. What we are talking as well is about the agri-food system being the major or the biggest environmental footprint that we have in Asia. So when I'm talking about why it matters, it's not just a discourse, it's not just a framework, it's not just another UN framework. Uh, it makes sense and that's where Brias fellow and I really hope that the way we connect it in, in, in this um, amazing opportunity that we have as a, a, as a fellow was to really interact with that narrative and that narrative of a change, that narrative of an action. And the first one that really came to mind for me is really about climate urgency. Again, you must all know already about the climate ur urgency, the previous COP that we had as well, and this limiting warning that we have to 2.5. Uh, and I think this is really important again to emphasize, we don't have time anymore. We have to explore model system thinking that allow better actions today for a better future. Now, Another important factor for me, and again, this is extremely important, it's about feeding a growing world population. By 2050, it is projected that 9.2 billion people will live in the planet. We will have to increase 70%, on average of 70%, of the food production. Are we capable to do that? Are we willing to do that? What kind of resources can we still trade? What kind of science and innovations can be brought into that equation? And this is very important. When Rashad was presenting from FAO, the four better, you know, better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life. We have to think about that better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life not happening in a peaceful way. There is no peace right now. We have to talk about major trigger of change, major urgency to tackle those issues now and not tomorrow. And I think one of the key points related to that again is we just have maybe to just stop for one second and just think that if we were not doing anything, what will be the costs? If no one was trying to implement those framework, if no one was working in a transplanted approach, what would be the cost? So two last slide here, and it's really about translating science to actions. And I think I'm really like in the best area um, with this Brias Fellowship to really think and discuss about how we can translate science, how we can translate it to better action, more robust action for a future that is resilient, that needs to be sustainable and inclusive. And I think again, I can only emphasize on how those science can really support better decision making, 
process, not only of policymaker, but as well of community, farming community, villager at all different scale. I'd like to put the IPCC share. Mr. Lee. Throughout this cycle, we have been telling the world that science has spoken and it's now up to the policymaker for action. This is really important. Science has spoken. Science is good. We do have science. We do have data. Now we need actions. And I really think that this type of fellowship have been um, enabling very rich conversations between the different fellow, but really with this narrative of how can we act? How can we help? How can we support? So how can we help? How can we support? Um, I'd like to talk just for one minute, maybe, and for those that are already aware about it, it's really about the UNFS, uh, which is the UN Food System. Um, many of you maybe have been participating to um, last year discussions where millions of people uh, have been engaging to that, uh, those meetings. Um, over 1,600 uh, summit dialogue were organized uh, last year around the food system. And now if I was going to host this um, coordination hope that is aiming to support, encourage inclusivity, um, sustain a narrative that all stakeholders can embrace and amplify, and really um, prepare a global stock taking moments about where we are in the food system, what should be our desired future, what are the possible future and what are the pathway or the actions that can really make that transformations. Um, this is all for me. I really hope that um, the reflection was uh, clear enough. Sorry to jump from past, present and future and decision making and action and science and uh, innovations. But this is really um, the narrative that I like to, to provide and to reflect on. Um, for some that uh, will ask what is the picture, is a, it's a beautiful narration about thousands of years ago about how people will narrate uh, their livestock and their farming community because we, we, we're not creating something new, we are enriching, I hope. Thank you. I love the silence, uh, but uh, <laughs> I can see that Annette, uh, Mike is on mute. <laughs> now can you hear me? Oh, I was can really you, like, oh my God, now? maybe they already left for the reception. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Although, thirsty for the drinks, but no, yeah, it's still here. So um, I was asking uh, about the organic farming and how the transition from traditional farming to organic farming uh, might also uh, contribute to the women environment in uh, Southeast Asia, if this is the case. Okay, I, I could hear very from far your questions. I'm really sorry. If, if I may ask, you can move towards the laptop. Um, so can, can, can you hear him now? Um, perfect, much more Perfect, better. great, <laughs> good. I will uh, take this uh, station then. Now, I was just asking, if uh, the transition from traditional farming towards organic farming is a uh, play a uh, role or if at all not to the woman empowering powering in um, in Southeast Asia. So uh, um, again, it, the, the complexity or the richness of, of farming culture in Southeast Asia is, is it's make it very difficult to make a, any kind of general uh, statements here. Um, when we think about rice, for example, um, going beyond uh, organic uh, farming, many of the poor community never use anything that was not organic because they never had access to any market. So again, it's because of the complexity and the richness of the different practice, the different ecosystem and the different landscape, you will have some ASEAN countries that are really like, will have to fight against 
being more productive, wanted to be more productive and being organic somehow is being less productive for them or within their mindset. And some of the country that actually never had really access to any market. So the practice actually is totally organic because they never use any kind of fertilizer or any different type of uh, input. Women have had a, a major role in into because they have usually harvest the different crop, including rice, which is one of the major crop in, in, in the regions. So th there is a major role um, which is recognized and uh, with they are a part of the farming community as being accepted in most of the, the country that I have been working in. Thanks very much, Katana. Can you hear can you hear me now on the microphone? Yes, I, I can I can hear you, but if you may shout a little bit more. All right, well we'll try to be as loud as possible. Um, uh, any other questions from the audience? Over time. Uh, here we are. Uh, I'll probably. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just probably walk up. No, I, I just wanted to make a first of all, thank you, of course, for your wonderful talk. It's just a, a comment because yesterday we also had a discussion. We had a, a workshop on colonialism and the influence on food uh, systems in Africa. And one of our speakers, uh, Professor Jonathan Robbins from the Technical University of Michigan, had also an interesting story about how women uh, had resisted part of the colon colonizers' uh, desire to industrialize the um, uh, palm oil uh, production because women uh, were really uh, the thriving force behind that business on the household level and they could make uh, money on the production, on the processing and on the, the marketing and the colonizer tried to uh, take away the first two steps and then only had that you can buy uh, they would only buy the raw product and um, then dislocate them from uh, from their economic activity. So they successfully managed to uh, to resist this and to boycott and also have other people in society boycotting these uh, uh, these larger scale industrial producers. So just as a, a little thought out there, just as a uh, that sometimes yeah, the market can be also one of these things that of course makes things more difficult for traditional. Uh, uh, societies and can also have very negative effects indeed for the role of women in uh, in those uh, in those groups. But uh. yes, and, and I am um, sorry because I was not in the talk of, of yesterday, but definitely like uh, markets and infrastructure and how we think about a productive uh, food system uh, have different impact, different context, different history. Any final questions for Ratana before we go today? Any in the back? All right, going once, going both. <laughs> oh, well then in that case, we'd like to give a warm thanks to Ratana. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks very much, Mr. Al-Khafaji, for Tana, for helping us close this spring program of BRIAS. Thank you all for joining us today. And um, we hope that you will stick around just a little uh, longer to join us at a reception, which is being held on the VUB campus at Bar Pilar. So please, uh, we invite you to join us. So thanks very much. I will put some links in the chat soon. Um, if you are interested in BRIAS, learning more about uh, the future events coming up, please follow us on LinkedIn on our website. We will be posting more information about our upcoming events and um, activities. So please follow us. Thank you very much for coming today. Bye-bye. <laughs>